Good evening. My name is Peter Chung. I'm head of Dyson School of Design and Engineering. And one of the very delightful thing, duty that we have as head is to chair inaugural lecture for newly promoted or newly appointed professor. And um, this event is really designed to celebrate somebody's achievement in their academic career and reach the uh, possibly highest level at Imperial College because you can't be promoted beyond professors. They don't have to fill in another promotion form ever again. And this evening, I'm delighted to uh, introduce to you Professor Trishantham Nanayakara. Uh, it's a really difficult name to pronounce, so we all call him just Thrish. Trish, actually, uh, his journey to us, he said he's not going to talk about his academic journey to this evening. Instead, I will. His journey to us is, is, is very colorful and spanned the globe. He uh, started his journey and life in Sri Lanka. In 1996, he graduated with first class honor in, at University of Maratunwa. And then he moved over to Saga University in Japan, where he got his master and PhD, finishing his PhD in 2001. Then he spent uh, a couple of years in John Hopkins University in the United States before returning as a senior lecturer at, uh, to Sri Lanka. During that time, he had an opportunity to go to United States again where he spent time at Harvard and MIT, and very fruitful years, where after that, he landed a senior lectureship position at King's College. Now, he stayed there for quite a while, from 2009 to 2016. Then, at, at, when we formed the Dyson School of Design Engineering 2000, in 2017, Peter Chow, my predecessor, poached him from King's College uh, with a readership, so he defected to us, not too far distance away. And very shortly after that, in 2021, he was promoted as Professor of Robotics. And since then, in our department, he formed a very vibrant group. He called this the Morph Lab, and, and I'm sure he will explain why he called it more flat, I'm sure. And currently, he is the chair of Imperial College Robotics Forum, where I was told that there are 44 groups, is that right? And, and lots of academics uh, working on robotics research at Imperial College. And this evening, his inaugural lecture is going to be talking about can robots help us understand who we are? So I don't want to delay any further. Would you uh, welcome uh, Frisch to come up? Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for coming today, uh, despite having train strikes. Uh, it's amazing to see this audience, uh, from students to my former colleagues and present colleagues. I start uh, my talk with uh, a, a, a statement uh, my colleague uh, Cecilia Lashi gave <coughs> uh, about robots. Uh, so intelligent machines will, will be more than uh, present uh, lives in the near future, though uh, may not be in, in the form of robots that we collectively think what they are. So this has a profound meaning, and then my whole talk will be uh, you know, trying to kind of elaborate that statement. Um, and Professor Shishira Lashi, as uh, Fumia, know all, everybody who knows about soft robotics is a pioneering figure and a very inspiring uh, leader in uh, women in science. Um, so can robots help us understand who we are? So uh, I start with this uh, clip from Boston Dynamics. You know, 
Uh, I'm not scared to uh, show this, uh, this failures like, you know, Boston Dynamics being a legend in robotics. They are not scared to show, uh, you know, where things go wrong. This is the truth about robotics, right? So in physical robots, things fail. It, it is not really easy. Uh, like in, you know, when maybe 10 things go right, 90 things go wrong. So uh, I, I, I pay, pay special thanks <laughs> to uh, Boston Dynamics first uh, for being a pioneering company uh, in robotics and being uh, very brave about you know, showing these things that go wrong. So that gives you the idea, right, how, you know, how difficult robot, robotics is and then how these experiments on real robots can help us understand who we are as humans, right? Um, uh, so why is it so difficult uh, to make physical interactions so complex? So this is just a hex bag, right? So if you have seen hex bags, this is just a plastic rubber piece, right? And then it has just a vibrator. And then it, with that simple vibrator, there are no sensors here, there's no thinking here, there's no computers here. It is just a rubber piece with a vibrator. And then, but if you see, if you, if you put it in open uh, space, it's a complete random walk. And if you, if you put it in some constrained environment, these are identical circles, but one is hard and one is soft. So you can see immediately that the behavior, uh, it elicits. Uh, you know, depends on the interactions it has with the environment and then the environmental contact dynamics determine how you see it, uh, its behavior. So if you think this, you know, kind of is reminiscent of a cockroach, uh, you know, trying to find the way out, and then you might think this has some kind of intelligence, it is trying to find its way out, but it is not, right? So this, this, this um, uh, brings home the idea that intelligence is an illusion, it is, it is a creation in your own mind by looking at it, but uh, you cannot really, you know, pin down to some source of intelligence, it is, it is it's an orchestration. And because of these interactions uh, can be very complex, even for this kind of very simple uh, robots, uh, you can imagine why, you know, what happened in the Boston Dynamics robot, right? So there are so many motors, so many, uh, you know, interaction, uh, interactions happening. It is, that is difficult, right? So after so many years of research, still we don't understand, truly understand, uh, how to make these dynamic interactions stable. Um, so that comes to our human uh, body. Uh, so how can we, you know, survive in this kind of natural environment so elegantly, right? So our computational machinery uh, has, you know, spans across several computational infrastructure, uh, you know, it's a spectrum. So on the, uh, I mean, you're familiar with this, right? So it's all the brain synaptic plasticity in the neurons and uh, roughly about 85 billion neurons, 85 to 100 billion neurons in the brain, making various connections to model the world, right? So the, you, you have some memory of my previous two slides because your brain right now made new circuits, right? So new networks, new connections. Within a fraction of a millisecond, it can create new patterns and then remember that, right? So that is how fast it can model the world. And on the right, uh, the, on the on your left hand side, we have physical computers, right? So, for example, your here has a funnel, and then it has a computational meaning, right? So of concentrating pressure waves that, that vibrates the eardrum, and then that propagates to a coil, like a tapered coil, right? So, when you when you vibrate a tapered membrane, what happens is it automatically, in real time, separates the frequency components, right, from low frequency to high frequency components, depending on the shape of that tapered uh, membrane. So what it does in our language is a Fourier series calculation done real time in a, in a physical hardware, right? And then those Fourier series, or like the Fourier components, frequency components, are picked up by cochlear hair and then fed to the brain, the auditory cortex, in a parallel fiber bundle. Right? And then the brain sees the sounds as frequency components in frequency features. And that way, you can hear things as I talk, right? Otherwise, if, if this, you know, time series data were sent to the brain, 
that you would hear things with a delay that is not going to be uh, very good. So if you see the eyes, you have a foveated vision, right? So if you, you look at somewhere, uh, you see that clearly, but the rest is smudged, right? So the peripheral vision is smudged. So that, that template is mask is there right at the eye level. And then you send that image to the brain, then the brain doesn't waste resources processing smudged areas of the vision. It processes only the high resolution area, right? It saves effort in processing, right? So that, that, that kind of morphological adapt. And then let's you take a bones, and we think these are just joints, right? So, and then like this knee joint, for example, this specific cam shape has a computational meaning. So when you walk, your feet experience very complex forces, so shear forces, you know, collision forces, but all that information is not needed in the brain to process the locomotion problem, right? So the knee joint with this cam profile uh, sitting in between summarizes the world for the brain, right? So for example, this comes to, you know, interesting bit. Uh, so in between the, the brain and the physical computers lies real-time tuning, right? If you ride a bicycle on a bumpy terrain in a wilderness, the brain doesn't need to know the bumpiness of the terrain, right, so to ride the bicycle. So what the brain would do is ask the, uh, you know, the body to <coughs> kind of come off the seat and then ride the bicycle with bent knees, right, making an angle there. So the moment you make an angle there, so this, this, this has ligaments, and then it creates a, a low-pass filter. So it is basically, there's an angle dependent damper, and then by changing the angle of the knee joint, it can tune the damper, you know, damping constant basically. So damping means filtering, right? So by, by setting the right damping constant in the knee joint, the brain imposes a physical low pass filter there, and then the brain uh, f doesn't feel as much you know, vibrations that the tires are feeling and then the brain can focus on low frequency information about locomotion. So the brain is smarter than what we think it is. Brain doesn't, you know, passively receive everything from the world. It tunes the body, right, to feel what it wants. Uh, and it just filters or sets the body to filter out what is, what it is not needed for, uh, to accomplish a task. So this, uh, for my entire robotics, career is about trying to use robots to understand what is happening here, right? So tuning and at the same time, locom you know, doing uh, behavior, right? So internal tuning to support the external action. Uh, so I will uh, structure my talk with three things I want to talk. Ghost circuits, these are made up terms. I, I, I made this up, right? <laughs> so, Gauss circuits, uh, I mean, if you want, uh, uh, Gauss circuits that entangle the brain, body, and the environment for efficient problem solving. And another term called behavioral lensing for accurate perception and kinematic tuning for stability and effort minimization. And then finally, how this can help future design engineering and to understand who we are. So these terms I will explain in more detail uh, in, the, in my upcoming book with Springer Nature on a handbook of soft robotics I'm writing with uh, several colleagues uh, in the world. So, uh, of, uh, before going to uh, talk about Gauss circuits, I want to talk about emergence, right? So this concept of emergence is very important, right? So this, uh, I, last time I went to uh, Kyoto for IROS, I took this picture from the Toji Temple. So this Toji Temple shrine has survived 400 years of Japanese earthquakes. And then, you know, it's very difficult to understand how it survived that many earthquakes uh, in Japan. And then this, this uh, the secret sly in this bio-inspiration from serpentine skeleton. So it is, it's like if you closely look at it, I took the closest picture I could. Um, so you can see these like arms and then these sliding bars on that. So when there's an earthquake, these layers can slide on each other. And then there's a slight curvature in that sliding surface. So imagine there's a basin and a bowl, right? So you shake the basin, the bowl will wobble and then but will settle down at the center point uh, when, the, when, the, when the shaking is gone. 
So what the building does is uh, the building uh, uh, swings and then this slight kind of curvature makes it stable, passively stable by design, right? It doesn't have to think about it. So when there's an earthquake, it, it behaves like a serpentine. And then when there's no earthquake, it is a solid structure. So what is important is like, you know, some lot of people think soft robotics is about silicon rubber or, you know, squishy things like, you know, soft as, as soft. <laughs> uh, but it is not true. It is soft robotics is, is about having structures that can, uh, you know, uh, behaves uh, or emerge a softness when the right level of forces and frequencies are present. Uh, that like, uh, like all, the, all the softness we are thinking about are normally human-centric softness, right? Human-centric forces. So at, at human level, what kind of forces we can give and what kind of forces we can experience, that is our softness, right? But it, it, is, it goes beyond that. The structures can have softness and it can be an emerging property. So this is not, nothing really new, right? So the ancient Chinese uh, philosophers, um, like Confucius philosophers, like I think 3,000, 4,000 years ago, they come up with the idea of yang and ying, right? So like if, if there's a strong wind, the, the, the grass would survive by bending, right? So it is like uh, presenting softness to hardness. So even Bruce Lee, uh, his, uh, you know, in the Tao of Jeet Kune Do, he took these ideas and then he, he, he developed his new martial art and then he said like, be like water, right? So it is like, you know, take the, take the shape of the container and then if there's a punch, just, just avoid it, right? So you're not going to block it or stay on that way, you just avoid it. So that way you can be a very efficient fighter and, and uh, we be very efficient. So these ideas of emergence are super important uh, for uh, my uh, definitions that will follow. So uh, Gauss circuits are very closely linked to the idea of reservoir computers, right? So uh, the reservoir computing uh, ideas uh, says that if there is some kind of a nonlinear dynamical system like this, we made it up in, in, the, in the lab, so there, let's say there are some nonlinear springs and you, you perturb it, you know, shake it from some end. And then you, we are tapping it from one end, but the whole spring system vibrates. And then these vibrations are not same, not the same. It, each node vibrates in different, different ways. So you can, you, like if you, if, you, if, you, if you are coming from a nonlinear, uh, control background, this is just Volterra kernels, right? So it is like, you know, in nonlinear control theory says if there's a nonlinear dynamic system, you can, you can reconstruct or approximate that function by a linear combination of Volterra kernels. So what it does is like, you know, you just take local vibrations and if you have sensors and then take a linear readout and then linearly combine them and then you can approximate a very complex nonlinear dynamic system. So, but the difference in Gauss circuits is that, uh, so there is a, a, let's say, a, by putting a spring uh, somewhere, and then these other springs together have their own nonlinear dynamics, but when this spring is put in the circuit, all behave differently, right? All behave differently, and then they all individually process some clear uh, nonlinear dynamic system. So you will understand this by this example. So there's this fish, dead fish, and if, it is, if, the, if there's no water flowing against it, it's a dead body, right? So belly up, dead body. But if, if there's a water stream, and then if, the, if there's any turbulence in that, the fish starts to swim against the stream, right? So this is first done at George Loder's lab at Harvard, uh, and then what happens is when there's turbulence, it hits the soft body of the fish and it creates this vortexes. And then the vortexes swirl and then you know, have like tangential forces against, uh, uh, against the fish, uh, against the stream of the water. So Gauss, the, I call this a Gauss circuit because part of the circuit is in the turbulent water like those springs. And another part of the circuit is in the fish. But if you take the fish only, you cannot see anything, right? This, 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 when, you're put, when you put the fish in the turbulent water, 
if the level of turbulence is in the right order, they will create together a single circuit like those spring circuit to solve a very complex problem of swimming against a stream of water, right? So this circuit was not there and then these pieces were there in different pieces, parts, but when they are put together, they emerge, right? So that's, it's like a ghost, that's why I call it a ghost circuit because it is not there, it is very elusive, you cannot see it uh, clearly, but the emergence you can see, right? So these circuits are used by you know, uh, schools of fish, uh, like the leading fish create vortexes, and then the other fish keep amplifying those vortexes. And then the fish coming from the back are very efficient. Like if you're tired, you just go to the back because it's very efficient to you know, swim at the back, right? So uh, some bird formations also do the same thing. Um, so this is uh, the basic idea of Gauss circuits. So uh, my PhD student, Yukun K, is work here. Um, so this kind of, you know, if the fish can swim against a stream of water, uh, can, we, can we have a capsule that can go backward and forward? You just use in the peristaltic wave in the intestine, right? So this uh, endoscopic capsule. So normal capsule will just flow down the intestine when you swallow it and then it takes images, right? So, but if you can have a capsule that can both go forward and backwards, uh, it can ca it collect more data, right? So images from early cancer, for example. So all what he did is like, you know, he had an origami structure and then he saw that if this origami structure is relaxed, uh, it'll go in one direction, but if the origami structure is collapsed, it goes backwards, right? It's the, uh, the, the peristaltic wave is, is the same, right? It is basically harnessing energy from the intestines, peristaltic wave, and it has no sensors, no actuators, just like that hex bug, but it does a very useful task of going forward and backward to collect more data. So, and uh, my uh, undergraduate students, uh, uh, James and Sibyl, so they are here, uh, so they, they went a step ahead, right? So they, they added a skin around it that can feel uh, early, early tissue, early cancer, right? So how it would feel uh, is like this, like if there's a, a, like a tiny nodule in the intestine, it will feel all like that, right? So it will see that nodule uh, and this cannot be visually seen, right? So it, it only can be felt uh, because it's too early in the intestine. Um, so uh, the, the ideas of uh, that kind of ghost circuits can be uh, useful in this kind of medical applications. Uh, so there's another example is uh, uh, Zengwa's work, uh, my collaborations with Peter Childs and Helmut Hauser. Uh, so let's say you have a mobile robot and it is going in darkness and it, it, it doesn't have any cameras. How do you know the terrain conditions. All what we did was like, you know, taking ex inspiration from this cochlear, we had that tapered spring and then we put just three whole effect sensors. And then <clears throat> if you look at in, in, under different terrain conditions, these three whole effect sensors feel the terrain, you know, kind of partition it into frequency components along the spring. And then we just take a linear readout. This is a reservoir computer I, I explained using springs. And then just take a linear readout and then we approximate the function of the terrain just using these three, three linear readouts. We could go more than 90% accurate in classifying different terrain conditions. Right? Uh, so uh, this is the power of uh, this kind of you know, ghost circuits that, that emerge as an interaction between the environment and your physical bodies that are, that are compliant. Uh, so another example is uh, uh, Sarah, uh, my former PhD student Sarah, and now she is a lecturer at UCL, and uh, 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 my former postdoc Nicholas Hersig, now her husband. Uh, so uh, we were in the same lab. Uh, yeah, those things happen. <laughs> uh, nice things. Uh, yeah. Um, so her question was. Uh, you know, mountain goats, right? So how do mountain goats survive on these steep cliffs, right? Uh, and you're wondering, like, you know, is, 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 is their brain is, has some kind of super, you know, processing capacity. It cannot be, right? 
So, uh, so then we suspected that it may be the hoofs that have some kind of a supercomputer. So we suspected that these ligaments and the bone structures are having some kind of a mechanical circuit which behaves like some kind of a ghost circuit that emerges when it slips and then it, it solves the slip reduction problem. If you look at carefully this coach Julia, like how she breaks on ice, like ice and the blade friction coefficient is the same, right? Now friction cannot explain how they break on ice. So, but how she implements something like a goat hoof, right? So uh, she curves her hip and the knee joint, she goes down, make it a compliant knee joint and like, as I said, like, uh, you know, a damper there and then immediately they break on ice, right? So they can go very fast and suddenly stop on ice just by uh, is implement, you know, this is a behavioral solution to a evolutionary solution, right? So, uh, and this is uh, my, the PhD student, Sarah, uh, presenting this hoof with Mark Rybert. You know, Mark Rybert is the founder of Boston Dynamics. So he, when he was giving a public lecture in London, he invited uh, Sarah to do a demo with him uh, in front of a large uh, public gathering. Uh, it was it was it was an amazing thing. Hope uh, Mark is watching this uh, talk <laughs> online. Uh, so uh, if you are, like, post a question. <laughs> so I told him that there's something. <laughs> uh, yeah. So he's a great, uh, you know, uh, a pioneer in in our robotics, and he's, a, he's an amazingly uh, brave man. Uh, I know. Uh, okay. So uh, another thing uh, we are very interested in is how the knee joint works, right? So how a uh, shock gap absorption happens. If you look at that cheetah, right? So it, 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 can, it can run at about 40 miles per hour, but look at his, how stable his body is, right? How stable the body is. So how, like we were so surprised, like, you know, how, how it can achieve. So, we did a very basic hypothesis testing. So see this, like, you know, if you imp implement an angle-dependent damper, this laboratory-made angle-dependent damper, and compare it with um, constant dampers, see what happens, right? Uh, so if it's damping is high, like, you know, it has some uh, little variation, but, like, you know, damping is low, uh, it has high variation, but the angle-dependent damper settles down of, uh, you know, higher than the other dampers and have low variability, right? So we are trying to extend these ideas to make this kind of very efficient uh, walkers uh, in the future. So our, we are part of uh, this uh, very large European Union um, uh, consortium called Natural Intelligence uh, with ETH and TU Delft and other uh, lots of colleagues and some robotics companies. So the idea is to get real robots uh, outdoors in European Alps and then monitor nature. While monitoring nature, it tries to survive in those natural environments and then gives us important information about how the hoofs should evolve or how the knee joints should evolve. And then that, that kind of a recursive process uh, that informs us about, you know, their behavioral atoms can maybe have, have some implication about what is missing in them in the design. And then maybe we can go back and then think about the hardware solutions that can make it more efficient for it to survive. Right? So this is a very exciting uh, uh, kind of a challenge we are uh, into. Uh, this is a real test in, in somewhere here uh, in Italy. Uh, so, but it, this is not having our knee joint or hoof yet. So we, we, our job is to contribute that. So it's a great consortium. Okay, so now I'm going to behavioral lensing. So behavioral lensing is, uh, this, this is the starting point, right? If you ask somebody to st estimate the weight of something, why do they bob it up and down, right? So they could just hold it and then say, okay, this is 100 grams or 200 grams but why do they bob it up and down? So this, this, this is the question, right? They, they take a behavioral approach to perception, right? So lensing in the sense like, so I'm saying like, so by taking behavior, they magnify the, the, the differences in perception, right? 
so if there's, you know, closely, I, I feel this is 100 grams. I'm not sure whether it is 120 grams, but if you bob it up and down in the right way, uh, 120 grams become so clearly different from 100 grams, right? Uh, so uh, what is the brain doing here, right? What is the brain trying to accomplish here? Because metabolism is costly, right? So brain doesn't waste energy for nothing, right? It does for a purpose. And you can see like, you know, subtle differences for 100, 200, 500, the subtle ways uh, or differences you can see in the way they do. So it is not a fixed stereotyped behavior. It is a interaction with the object is entangled with the environment. So that is a very interesting observation. So behavioral lensing can be seen as, if I go back to my uh, spring example, so you take this linear readouts and you're trying to estimate the weight of something or you know, estimate some random variable. If you're not very clear about these readings, you can go back and then ask your own body to behave differently or stimulate the environment, interact with the environment differently. Right? So, and that, that way you, you magnify the differences among the nodes uh, by taking the right behavior. So that I call it behavioral lensing. Okay, so uh, 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 one example is a former PhD student, Constantinova Gilles-Vital, we call her Lisa. Now she's a senior research, uh, I think, uh, coordinator at Ocado Technologies. Uh, so what she noticed in her PhD was like, you know, when people try to palpate a soft tissue to understand some t tissue condition, they, they wiggle their fingers, right? So why do they just don't press and, and tell me what is on inside? But why do, they, why do they just wiggle their finger, right? So they can press. So she noticed that there's a structure to that wiggling, right, about to, to kind of 20 hertz uh, sinusoidal uh, wiggling, and then there's a normal force going up and down in a, in a mathematical structure. Uh, and then, uh, so she implemented that mathematical equation she derived from this human behavior on a robot to see what is really happening, right? And then she collected force data. What she saw was really surprising. Uh, so she saw, compared to a just pressing, right? Compared to just pressing, you, given a tissue, when you press, you feel some stiffness, right? But if you wiggle your finger, if there's nothing inside, like, you know, there's no hard formations inside, the tissue liquefies under your finger, and then you feel the tissue to be softer than what it is. But if there's a nodule, you feel it harder than what it was, right? Compared to just pressing. So by taking wiggling, you are taking a behavioral approach to lens it, right? So magnify the difference, uh, uh, magnify the effect of perception, right? So this is another classic example of behavioral lensing. Like I, I don't know, I, mean, I just made up these words, but like I'm trying to you know, s you know, explain things we are kind of discovering in the lab. Uh, so this is very important. And then the important thing is these kind of taking very uh, controlled experiments, we can mathematically model the human behavior. Right. So uh, another um, uh, example is how our fingertips are uh, interacting with our own phys you know, morphological features. So we have mechanoreceptors in the fingertips, and then when you touch something, the flesh vibrates, and then that vibrates the mechanoreceptors, and then that is how the brain knows that you are touching something and then at some, you know, frequency components. And uh, we put, uh, we, we simulated that with a simple magnet and the whole effect sensors around it. And then when you touch something, these whole effect sensors kind of dance around that magnet. And then you can read out, take a readout from that. And then in, like if you have three uh, readings, like so you have a three by three covariance matrix, don't worry about it. If I look at some mathematical features like eigen uh, vectors, we can separate different like plastic, rubber, leather, denim, aluminum. It, these, are, these get separated in that space very clearly. Uh, if, you, if, you, uh, uh, if you have that kind of you know, uh, soft structures, that can be controlled. But what is more interesting is like uh, uh, 
like this, this, this was done by my former PhD student with Shinichi Hirai in Ritsume Khan University. And the two undergraduate students, Amy and Sam, came, did the RR robotics research projects module with me. They suspected that our morphological features like the nail and then the distal phalange bone may have some, you know, uh, tuning uh, conditioning effect on this, right? They, they clearly noticed that we are compared to a, a fingertip without a bone and without a nail versus a fingertip without a nail without, with the bone uh, and then with nail only without bone and then no uh, bone and the, and the nail, they have very clear differences in the way these things get separated in the eigenspace. So that means our morphological features have a computational meaning, right? So that if you don't have the nail or you cut the nails, the way you feel is going to also be different, right? So these are not just like, you know, uh, beauty things. Uh, it, it has computational meaning. It, it helps you to solve computational problems of touching. Uh, and if I come back to uh, Zingwa's example, so this behavioral lensing again happens there, right? So this uh, spring, uh, I said like it separates these frequency components along the spring, and that is how we can know the texture. But if you speed up or if you change the speed, these things get more and more separated, but it doesn't linearly change with speed. At some higher speed, it gets smudged again, right? So there's a, there's a best speed it can find to know that terrain. Like for another terrain, it might, it might have to do a different, uh, you know, behavior uh, in that. So this is, this is very interesting for us. So behavioral lensing, again, is about taking behavioral action. You can magnify the effect of perception and make it more efficient to deal with the uncertain environment, right? Um, so the last one I want to talk about is the kinematic tuning. Uh, this, this, this is about like, so the same uh, spring example, there's a perturbation, but how about I change the stiffness of one spring and then I can, if, you know, affect the whole entire network, right? So this is something like, you know, that, um, uh, the bicycle rider example I gave, right? You know, if, you are, if you're riding a bicycle on a bumpy terrain, so the brain can tune the, tune the posture and then set the right stiffnesses in, in the, or dampers in the joints and then completely f change the way it feels the world, right? Uh, or interacts with the world. Uh, so, uh, or make it more stable uh, in certain environments. The way you would walk on ice is different from the way you would walk on sand or grass, right? So the body always tunes your body while interacting with the environment, right? So that is, I call it kinematic tuning. Uh, third principle, right? Uh, so this is um, uh, another example of my former PhD student. Saina Akon, uh, so she, her question was, how about looking at this, you know, brief uh, episodes, uh, for example, these monkeys are experiencing brief bipedal episodes, right? So when they carry something, they have to go bipedal. So that means the brain has to force the body to behave um, in, a, in a very different way they would behave normally. So she tested that. Uh, hypothesis that the brain's, brain's effort to tune the hip might carry some information about how the, how the hip should evolve in the future, right, to be more stable bipedal walkers. So she just got an inverted pendulum and then she has a motor, that, a controller that controls the inverted pendulum. So all of you know, right, so you can control inverted, stabilize the inverted pendulum by pushing and pulling a base. But the difference is there is a local uh, motor at this pivot joint that observes how that motor is trying to push and pull, right? But this motor doesn't know anything about that external motor. This motor doesn't know that there's another motor at the pivot joint. They, they don't have any communication. They, all what they do is like, you know, this motor has the task of stabilizing this inductor pendulum. This motor at the pivot joint is trying to figure out what the other motor is trying to do in, in a different way, right? so in, a, in, a, like in, in the sense that like, you know, what is missing in my joint, right? So if, if, if something is missing 
in this joint. This, is, this joint is trying to be wobbly and then try to fall. That is why somebody else has to push and pull. Then what is missing? It, by looking at the shape of pushing and pulling, it realizes after some time that there's a spring missing here in this joint. Right? So let's say in the, in the joint you have two springs pulling uh, uh, on two sides. If you, even if you do a perturbation, it will settle down automatically, right? So because there are two springs, right? And then because there's no two springs, the, another motor has to push and pull this, right? That push and pull is equivalent to having, you know, trying to implement two springs there, okay? So, uh, so then it realizes it, it tries to grow a spring there and then it watches how the other controller behaves. So what we saw, she saw was like, if the stiffness keeps increasing, there is a, there is a minimum effort, uh, control effort at some solution. And then if you keep increasing the stiffness, this also finds it difficult to control. That means they settle down automatically to a, a responsibility sharing uh, you know, agreement, right? So they didn't talk to each other, but they, the, the, the pivot motor, uh, settles down to some kind of a stiffness, and then the remote controller uh, settles down with a low energy control effort. And then this is pretty equivalent to our evolution, right? So uh, like the brain tries, to, uh, brain tries to control the body uh, to implement things that are not there, and then that information can be taken as some kind of epigenetic memory uh, for you know physical evolution in in the in the in the future. So this is just a hypothesis. This is debatable, but this is uh, right now our our position, proposition. Right. So that's kinematic tuning. So kinematic tuning can be seen in, during palpation. We we saw we took EMG data from people when they palpate, and then we saw that there's wiggling in the core contraction level, right? So of the of the muscles. And then that means like the, even when you're palpating a soft tissue, the brain is trying to figure out what would be the best stiffness of those joints that would make it feel, you know, feel more accurate. So that is again a, a, a kinematic tuning effort. Uh, so we tested that hypothesis with a robotic finger. So all uh, you can see all throughout my talk, whenever we have a hypothesis about the human body, we test it in a robotic counterpart, right? So because we can control and isolate phenomena, uh, and then we can say exactly, okay, so this is on the only sensor we have uh, that represents a tendon, and then this is the only thing that we do, like we change the stiffness of the finger by pushing and pulling this lever. So this is, uh, uh, you know, trying to understand how the GPs are doing, general practitioners, physicians are doing, when uh, they try to estimate the internal organ conditions. What we see is that by controlling the stiffness of the finger, just by controlling the stiffness of the finger, we can change the way the, this force sensor feels the nodule, right? So the perception uh, behavior is the same. It is a sweeping behavior, but the perception can be influenced just by controlling the stiffness. That is why the GPs, uh, you know, experienced GPs control the finger stiffness while doing their physical examinations, and it is extremely difficult to teach medical students how to do it because it's an internal tuning process. It is not visible from outside. Uh, so this is a collaboration with Etienne, uh, and then we saw in this experiment too, uh, so if you are given a visual noise and then there's a tracking problem, uh, and then the people have a choice to stiff, uh, you know, control the core contraction, the stiffness of the joints, but how we tested was uh, that's, that co-contraction will, will control a virtual coupling uh, with the target, right? So this target is buried in that uh, cloud, and then the stiffness of that spring can be tuned by co-contracting the muscles. So what, the, what is interesting is when we give different levels of visual noise in that cloud, uh, sorry, visual cloud, uh, it doesn't look like. So we can see a residual uh, stiffness in the, in the hand, and then it doesn't go, uh, go down anymore. And then if there's no visual uh, noise, it'll, it'll, it'll gradually go down, uh, starting from some kind of a co-contraction, and they relax 
and then at, at uh, when there's high visual noise, there's stiffening, right? That means by taking a tuning approach, they try to feel it better when there's visual noise. So there's another uh, um, question about another behavior the physicians are taking. It's about percussion, right? So uh, physicians have been per you know, using percussion for centuries uh, to, uh, to examine patients, but uh, we didn't understand what is really happening. Right? Is it just like uh, they are listening to some sounds or they are feeling something more, right? So our suspicion was they are, they are feeling uh, like in a palm, uh, it is, they are using the palm as a tactile antenna. Uh, when you tap and then these waves propagate through the structure and then it hits back your palm and then on the palm you can feel it, right? So we found that by just having five regions of, sorry, five regions of perception, you can have about you know 97% accuracy in in identifying uh, various features in the soft tissue. Right? So this paper was uh, won the best paper award at IROS. Uh, have, you know it was held uh, just uh, October uh, in in Japan. Uh, so this the the amazing thing is this was done by a group of undergraduate students. Right. Uh, so it is everybody knows how difficult it is to get IROS best paper award. But it's, it's amazing that these, uh, our design engineering students could accomplish that. Okay, so how these ideas of Gauss circuits, behavioral lensing and kinematic tuning can come together to solve user-centered design engineering problems, right? So I will show you a couple of examples. Uh, uh, one is this autosis device. It's a collaboration with the Zhuzhou Central Hospital in China. Uh, and then this, uh, the hospital told us that these the, the, the farmers who are coming with these wrist injuries, and then we have these autosis devices, but when they go home, they have these pressure points, and right? it is painful. And then they have to come back to the hospital. Is there a way to minimize that kind of you know, uh, returns to the hospital? So we developed a tactile sensor underneath the, the, the autosis device, and that can, that can sense these pressure points developments. Uh, this is me at, in China in the Shishou Central Hospital. This is a really, really large hospital uh, serving about something like uh, something like two, two million people. Uh, but we had a problem. So because this, this sensor rubs against the skin and in, you know, sitting between the skin and the orthosis device, it gets false alarms and then all these noises. So we found a way like to design a, a fish scale type periphery that automatically filters the noise to the periphery and then leaves the sensor intact, right? Uh, so this is a morpholo purely a morphological solution. So you can call it a, a, a ghost circuit or, you know, uh, a, uh, yeah, mostly that. Uh, that solves the problem, right? So you don't have to have like sophisticated sensors or sophisticated computational algorithms. This morphological solution fixes that, right? If you had a homogeneous fish scale, it, uh, it gives that noise at the sensor. So, um, uh, they will, uh, Sibyl and Thelina will uh, uh, show you a, a demonstration of this robot patient. Uh, there's another, um, Example where uh, is uh, Liang He, my former PhD student, now he's a postdoc at Oxford University. Uh, our dream was this, right? So you saw this, uh, this, uh, uh, this octopus. Uh, see this octopus, how it camouflages into a seaweed in in a in a in a few seconds, right? It disappears to a, a seaweed. So our, 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 we took that as an inspiration and asked the question, can we, can we have robotic patients in the hospital and with internal organs that can camouflage a physical patient somewhere in the, at home, right? Uh, and then you basically physically project the patient from home to the hospital. Uh, if the, the robot at hospital can camouflage somebody's organs. Uh, so all what you have to do is to have some kind of a wearable jacket that scans the organs of the patient and it just projects uh, the patient to the hospital so that the doctors in the hospital 
can examine the patient. So that started the idea of uh, the robot patient, right? So, uh, but we went beyond that. So we, uh, we uh, immediately noticed that it is uh, the facial expressions of pain during physical examination is a very important source of information for the doctors to take judgments about the internal organ conditions, right? But if the same pain is given from different ethnic or gender backgrounds, uh, depending on your exposure to different cultures and gender, you might feel the same pain expression differently, right? This is true uh, be among, you know, between any ethnic group versus another ethnic group, any gender, male, male, female, this is true, right? Uh, so uh, this is not something with like black versus white or anything, no, anybody like, so for example, a South Asian doctor migrate into London, uh, you know, if that South Asian doctor has seen only South Asian faces in his whole life, when they come to London, like, you know, suddenly like 120 more, more countries uh, of patients here, they will struggle, right? Uh, they, they, they will struggle to uh, examine these patients. So we have, we, we need a method to train uh, young medical students uh, in, a, in, a, in a more robust way and then measurable way. So that is uh, how we develop the robot patient. So Sibyl will uh, palpate that abdomen and you can see uh, the, the robot patient will give you expressions of pain depending on that physiological condition and then the, the teacher can, for example, can set various conditions in that abdomen and then see how the medical student palpates and we can record forces and things like that and then see how they perceive. So we did a very simple experiment. So we had uh, th uh, three blocks and the first block has presents very diverse faces, keeping the pain map the same, right? So the force to pain map is the same, but it is presented from different gender and ethnic backgrounds. Uh, and then we see very diverse ways of palpating, right? So across various ethnic groups, right? It is not just one ethnic group. And then in the middle group, uh, block, we show a pain bar, right? So pain bar proportional to the real pain. So this is, this is because it's a pain bar, it is, it is neutral. It is not biased by anything. And then we see the students see the pain bar and the facial expression at the same time. Then we thought that the brain would develop a, a interconnection between these two inf sources of information, building a new model, right? New internal model that maps diverse facial expressions to a uniform or unified uh, pain uh, indicator. And then we go back to the first block after 40 trials of this. We go to the first block and then they don't know that we went to the first block. They feel that it is a third different block and then we see something very interesting. So what we see is from the block one to block three, uh, the peak palpation forces drop, right? And then they become, uh, you know, less variant, right? So there's huge variability in the first block. And then after the second block, the third block, the variability reduces, they become very uniform, right? And then the judgment becoming more accurate. And then the standard deviation of the peak palpation force drops and then becomes more uniform. And then the localization error, they keep roughly the same with a slight drop, right? So this, uh, this helps us, uh, this is tested now at uh, Oxford University Radcliffe Hospital with medical students and uh, Hammers, our own Hammersmith Hospital with medical students. So if this continues to show us this promising information, our plan is to incorporate a robo-patient assisted a, mo a, a module in the medical curriculum. So we are closely working with uh, medics and then they are very excited about this outcome. And then from Dyson School of Design Engineering, we are very proud uh, to say that uh, this is something a user-centered, uh, you know, behavioral augmentation intervention we could introduce uh, to improve our doctors, right? So the performance of our doctors. Thank you, Sibyl and uh, uh, Tathilina, their hard work that led to this. And then there's one more person I want to mention, uh, Jacob Tan, there's another undergraduate student. Uh, Sibyl is an undergraduate student, like, you know, but being an undergraduate student, she could publish a Nature Scientific Reports paper, right? So it's amazing, right? Thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, 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 my work with the Florence uh, Leong is postdoc and colleague Master Kajari. So we are developing a, a, a further a, a surrogate model of uh, abdominal. Like we took uh, MRI images and then did FEM simulations. Masdak is a world famous uh, expert in uh, modeling uh, soft tissue dynamics. And then we developed a ne deep neural network based uh, surrogate model that people can interact with. So when a medical student examines the abdomen, they will get a projection about how the, how the internal organs uh, are experienced in uh, the palpation forces. This will develop another model on top of the other model we discussed um, uh, to, uh, to help them imagine how the internal organs might be affected by their palpation forces. This will make it more and more uh, efficient and accurate. Uh, so this, we are extending this with a haptic mouse, with a virtual patient so that you know, beyond borders, we can extend our medical education uh, services to other countries and uh, you know, uh, across the globe. So this is uh, work under development with another biomedical engineering undergraduate student, Rasne. Uh, she's a very brilliant uh, undergraduate student working with Tilina. So in summary, uh, so there's no single residence uh, for intelligence. It is just a perceptual manifestation of cross circuit dynamics involving the brain, body, and beyond. And carefully designed robotic experiments can help to untangle the puzzle. Uh, so the, like I gave you these two examples. And uh, brain's continuous effort for behavior lensing and kinematic tuning to influence cross circuits may carry information about future physical adaptations. This is very important for maybe industry 4.0 or beyond uh, to get robots to try out various uh, ways to survive in different environments and inform their designers back, uh, you know, how the design should be, should be redesigned. Like, so this is basically evolution happen, happening uh, with the interaction between the robot and the human, their designers, uh, in, in, a, in a recursive way. But, the, but this time the robot is telling the designer how the, how the robot should be redesigned, right? Not the designer thinking about how the robot should be redesigned. Uh, so this is a, a, a frontier we are perceiving in the future. Uh, and then um, the field of design engineering can benefit from this deeper understanding about how ghost circuits work to determine human experience in an augmented environment, these examples I gave. So uh, design engineering is really the premises to, to, to empower humans and then get the human experience to be a better one. So for that, robots can help us understand what the user uh, is and then how they behave. And all these behaviors can be really modeled using robots. So, uh, Finally, hypothesis testing on robots is a viable method to understand biological phenomena to do with intelligent behavior. This is robot-inspired biology than biologically-inspired robots. So a lot of people ask me, like, what are you doing? Are you doing uh, biologically-inspired robots? No, <laughs> I'm doing robot-inspired biology. Right. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, so uh, I think this is the last slide. Uh, so you can see, you know, the robotics industry is growing at about 35 to 40 percent uh, compound annual growth rate, a fastest growing industrial sector. And then most of the industries you can see. Now Europe has, you know, has a growing larger share now. Uh, it used to be Asia. Now in North America and Europe are really picking up. And then most of the companies are employing less than 200 employees, right? So what that means is they don't have a lot of firepower to do this basic science, uh, to, to, uh, to do groundbreaking uh, you know, scientific discoveries or innovations. It has to happen here. It has to happen at universities. So this is how we distinguish ourselves from this company. And then all the work we are doing has a meaning in, in you know, giving the fuel they need to become successful. So that is why I want to thank all the funding agencies for uh, EPSRC and the European Union for continuing to fund this kind of basic questions. Uh, 
so finally, I thank all my P former and present PhD students and uh, my all the collaborators. Uh, and there's no, there's no secret code here, but, <laughs> uh, but I should say this, uh, the people at the bottom, um, they, they took some decisions or risks in uh, some critical turning points in my life, including my PhD advisors, postdoc advisor, uh, and my wife, Vishaka, she took a risk. <laughs> uh, and it proved to be a wrong decision. Uh, and uh, so all other people, right? so I, I may explain them uh, if you have any questions in, in, in the Q&A session. Thank you very much. Hey. Uh, we have a few minutes for a few questions. We are going to interleave between live questions and online questions. So, anyone want to kick off? Yes, Peter Corley. There's a microphone here. in the linearity point. Um, you showed, I think it was a pul pulpation example, where you had a nodule size versus <coughs> palpation force or something. And it wasn't monotonic. So yes. it appeared that one size of nodule was much easier to, te to detect than another or, so, or something like that. Yes. So isn't this a big disadvantage if you don't get a linear response out of these systems? Yes, uh, so it is, it is a disadvantage and an advantage. Uh, so uh, how, the, how the brain seems to be tackling that problem is to take that behavior, tune, tune that behavior. So they, they try to uh, stimulate that tissue with various you know, wiggly movements and then kind of synthesize uh, nonlinear, the very you know, productive nonlinear dynamics or nonlinear attractors that con consistently attract to the same solution. Uh, so uh, rather than a linear system, the advantage of having a nonlinear system is like that, for example, that uh, Toji temple I, I mentioned. It doesn't matter what earthquake it has, right? So it'll settle down straight, uh, at, at, you know, kind of settle down at the same attractor. So the brain seems to be taking a, um, a very active approach to stimulate the right behaviors to tackle that nonlinearity. Uh, use that nonlinearity to settle down at the right uh, solution. It's, 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 it's to be understood more in detail uh, in the future. I'm really interested in that, you know, how the brain is tackling that. Yes. Okay. Uh, is there an online question? We are going to interleave between that. I'll come back to you in a minute. Okay. Your research is about extracting such physical intelligence into machines. Are there elements of intelligence embodied in tissue that may have a link to how two or more intelligent beings interact? Yes, uh, I mean, intelligence, uh, like, okay, so um, the thing is, there's nothing called intelligence, right? Uh, and then the thing is, the tissues themselves, as is, uh, for example, the, the, the bones and the, the joints, they have computational uh, machines embedded in them. Uh, and then, uh, so when they when they interact with the world, they they they, they emerge seemingly intelligent behavior, like that hex bug, uh, you know, that was interacting with that soft or hard wall, and that the intelligence is in the observer, right? So uh, when you watch it, you feel that oh, that is intelligent, right? So but the muscle didn't know anything about like you know anything anything intelligent, right? So it is our our synthesis, our our illusion. Asper. Yep, thank you for the fantastic talk, really excellent. Um, and I, I think it's an interesting idea to speak about robot-inspired biology, that's what you're saying you're doing. But on the other hand, you're saying you are an engineer, design engineer. So maybe you don't want to ask, answer my question because, um, yeah, I mean, you're, you're doing robot-inspired biology. But at the end of the day, I think you want to also create machines. Yes. So my question is, will we, 
will we be ever able to reach a level where these machines are as good as humans? Oh, great, Casper. So why did you ask that question? <laughs> yeah. it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's a tricky question, right? So uh, the thing is, um, we want to make a useful product. So it is, for me, it's a byproduct of this process, right? So if you, if you try to test a biological hypothesis uh, with a robotic counterpart, you think what the biology did first and then you, you fail first. And then you retune that and you adapt that design till it comes somewhere close to the biological phenomenon. And then in that process, uh, like inadvertently, you are doing a design engineering process, right? So you're trying to understand a problem. And then in that process, you're iterating a design. And then a, there are two outcomes. One is you end up understanding the biological problem uh, that you thought was something different at the beginning. And at the end, you end up uh, making a robot uh, that is a useful thing, which can compete with the biological uh, you know, phenomenon, which is great, right? So, but I don't think uh, any robot will exceed the biological phenomenon in that process. Uh, m maybe, I don't know, uh, but um, like my feeling is design engineering process should be really focused on empowering the human and then not to go beyond. Okay, now. Next online, any question? Uh, in kinematic tuning from Sena's work, can you have multiple settling point? Yes, it's a, it's a feature of a nonlinear dynamic system. There can be multiple settling points and multiple solutions to a nonlinear system. And then we really don't know uh, which settling point to settle down. That maybe that is maybe one reason why there's you know this diversity within a species also, right? So they, they, they converge to different solutions. Okay. Any other questions from the floor? Yes, uh, microphone, Sibyl. So you talked about hex bugs and how their unintelligent behavior can be seemingly intelligent because yeah. it's in the eye of the beholder. Could it not be argued that all seemingly intelligent behavior is based on clever ghost circuits? So if we break down a human into tiny, tiny, tiny clever structures interacting with one another, could it be argued that everything is a ghost circuit? Yes. Uh, for me, the whole universe is a ghost circuit. <laughs> and that is why I think uh, the Internet of Ideas is, the, is one of the most powerful ghost circuits in uh, the, ever the universe has. Is, is that Gabriel? <laughs> okay. Hi, um, so you talk about like incorporating um, the goat circuits, so for example like with the fingertips and sensors um, or like the hooves of the goats, but how do you actually incorporate those mechanisms into the design of the robot? Because obviously you can't just have the mechanisms by themselves, so is the best way, like with the human for example, just trying to create the most accurate human possible, um, or would you incorporate it into, like how would you design the robot to incorporate mechanisms? Right, that's a, yes, a very good question, We're pretty related to what Cass asked. Uh, so what we do is like we first have a, some kind of hypothesis about the, 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 the human does. Like for example, the knee joint, we have some guess, right? So yeah, it's, it has this cam profile. Maybe it is doing this. So we first uh, mathematically model it and then do uh, lots of simulations and then if we see something interesting, we abstract that phenomenon to uh, 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 design. It doesn't have to, you saw our, our, our knee joint, it doesn't look like a knee joint, it's just a pivot joint. Inside we have some mechanism that doesn't look at all like a knee joint. All what we do is abstract that phenomenon of angle dependent damping, that's all. We, we implement it in a different way, totally different way. Uh, it is not biomimicry that, that in that sense. We totally d take a design approach uh, to implement the same phenomenon. And then we find that, oh no, that design doesn't even come close to uh, what the biological knee joint is doing. Then we do design iterations. 
uh, and we retune our own hypothesis and then we end up understanding uh, something totally new, totally different and then invalidate our own hypo initial hypothesis. And it's a kind of series of hypotheses basically, uh, you know, developing. When you read our papers, you will see our final hypothesis that was tested to be true. And then what you don't see is like, you know, our first hypothesis that was not true. Right. So if you read all the scientific papers, 99.999% of the hypotheses are right uh, because of that. <laughs> and that's another online paper. Uh, question? Um, rather intrigued, is there a suggestion here that the brain can compute what extra information it wants and contribute this to um, physiological evolution? Uh, I didn't get it, uh, Hannah. Can you... Can you um, is there a suggestion here that the brain can compute what extra information it wants and contribute this to physiological evolution? Uh, so I'm, I'm not making a very hard claim on that. Like I know, you know, some people don't like uh, the idea of epigenetic memory. Uh, so, uh, but when I you know, talk with my colleagues in biology, evolutionary biology and epigenetic memory, they, they say that, you know, this uh, long um, a, a history of, you know, hundreds of thousands of, you know, millions of years of behavior can carry information uh, that the epigenes can encode to be physically equivalent, uh, you know, solutions, right? That can get into the genetic structure later on. We are not challenging Darwin or, you know, Darwin said what he could uh, given his, you know, whatever the information he had at that time, we are just topping up on him, right? So we are not challenging or you know, kind of denying him. Uh, so what we are saying is like behavior from the brain, if, if the brain continues to uh, make attempts and then finds a solution, it doesn't make sense to brain, for the brain to carry on doing that. It makes sense to delegate that to the physical body but the challenge is the brain is taking a different approach of controlling and then the body's uh, epigenetic responsibility might be to find the physical equivalent of that, right? So like that inverted pendulum problem. And then they settle down, the brain and the body settle down to a common problem. So this is the first robotic demonstration of what might be happening in the epigenetic uh, memory process, but I'm not, claiming anything right now, right? So we'll continue to explore. Yes. Okay, one, this is the last question from the floor here. Um, we are starting over. Uh, uh, thank you, sir. This time. is very inspiring talk. Uh, can I ask you a question about, like, what do you think, what's the fundamental difference between robotic sensing and human sensing? Because there are certain things that human can do but robots cannot, well, so there's something that robots can do but human may find it difficult to achieve. So mm -hmm. um, what's your take on that? Uh, so the human sensing is, is, uh, is uh, the evolutionary process has, uh, you know, settlement uh, with our sensors that are really have good enough resolution and good enough uh, timing or functionality to solve the kind of things we do with the nature, right? So environment, right? So we don't have X-ray eyes, or we don't have like you know like uh, eagle eyes, because we don't do eagle what eagles do, or we don't do you know superhuman stuff. Uh, so we have that, right? So a robot can go beyond, uh, depending on what what they want to do. Uh, so they can have eagle eyes, or uh, you know X-ray eyes or very high resolution uh, fingertips and things like that. In fact, we are thinking about that kind of superhuman fingertips for uh, palpation and things like that. So while experience enforces, it can also uh, see a scan of the internal organs. This is good to project a patient from uh, home to the hospital. For that, we will use that. Uh, so it is okay to go beyond human um, uh, for, for that kind of things, but finally, it is not about going beyond human or superhuman. It's about empowering that patient and let's say the hospital system, uh, reducing the congestion in the hospitals and then empowering these patients not to go to the hospital all the time, <laughs> they feel sick. So by having this robotic interface, right? So that's, that is what we want to solve. Yeah. Okay. I
think um, we have to cut all the questioning to this point. And uh, thank you, Trish, for answering the questions. I would now like to invite Professor Aida from University of Cambridge to give a vote of thanks. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Thresh and everyone. Uh, my name is Fumi Aida from University of Cambridge, and uh, this is my great honor to represent all the great audience here uh, to give a vote for the inaugural lecture of uh, Thresh. And uh, I just want to introduce a, a, a bit of my episode uh, with Thresh. So when I met first time uh, Thresh, it's uh, I think it's about 15 years ago. I, I don't know whether you remember this, but uh, uh, that moment was so memorable for me. Uh, so I, I was at uh, that time a postdoc at MIT, and Fresh was uh, a postdoc at Harvard. And uh, I was told that I'm meeting with a serious robotics researcher from Harvard. So I was prepared for very serious discussion about robotics. But then when he turned up, um, what he talked about is a little animal. I think it was a weasel or otter or something. I don't really know. Uh, um, and the, he was so enthusiastically talking about this. And uh, what was more shocking is that uh, he was actually using this poor animal for the purpose of uh, explosive detection or mind uh, detection, uh, the run mind detection or something like that. Uh, and uh, this was uh, really shocking. Of course, this was very important, you know, fundamental problem in his home country in Sri Lanka at that time. So I understand why he's doing this, but you know, at the same time, I just, that made me thinking, why this serious researcher, robotics, the roboticist, you know, talking about this weasel uh, for uh, the landmine detector, right? And that, so it took some time for me to understand this, but you know, I think there's a really, really uh, hidden message there that you know, we really, really need to understand what's wrong with robotics, right? Our robots are not used, cannot be used for this kind of thing, so we don't have a serious understanding what's, what's biological system, what's wrong with our system, uh, our uh, understanding of technologies. Uh, and moreover, we're just thinking too much about um, you know, economical impact of robots, or what's the business out of this, what's you know scientific question. We should really think about the practical, really fundamental question, live or uh, death uh, situation with the uh, uh, bombs and everything. So uh, that made me really, really thinking about uh, for some time. And uh, um, obviously, this discussion didn't go to any you know, collaborations or whatsoever at that time, because uh, this was too wild, right? This is typical Thresh. He talks about really a lot of really different things, exciting things. I don't really know why he's talking about this, but it was fascinating. Um, and then, uh, so we separated our career uh, for a while, and uh, um, our collaboration started about um, seven, eight years ago. So it took uh, seven, eight years for me to really digest this uh, 30 minutes, uh, really intensive discussion about really, well, I didn't really know what was it. Um, but anyway, so ever since I moved to the UK 2014, last seven, eight years, we had a really, really great com uh, conversation, and we started a lot of uh, uh, collaborative projects, student exchange, and uh, all the uh, um, uh, co-author publication, and so on, and we had really, really great uh, uh, fun ever since. So I just want to summarize, you know, by introducing this episode. This is really Thresh, right? He is um, talking about really fundamental thing. He talks about lots of lots of things. We don't really, um, uh, I don't, we don't really understand what he's talking about at the, the first place. Uh, but then it sticks to our mind. So I had a lot of strange experience in the US and lots of strange people, especially in MIT. But this kind of you know, conversation with the Thresh was really sticking with mind. Uh, and that made a very fruitful uh, collaboration afterwards. And uh, so um, with this, I really, really like to conclude my, uh, my, my speech uh, here uh, about you know, why Thresh is like this, right? He, he's talking about so many things. Many students might wonder you know, what he's talking about. Uh, we, don't, uh, we don't understand what he's talking about, but still, this is a really exciting thing. Uh, and especially, he's working on very fundamental question about biology, about technologies, and about our society. So uh, this is uh, uh, really the um, 
the, the drive of his research and drive of his all this network uh, collaborations with other people. And uh, I would like to uh, thank, on behalf of all the uh, friends and all the uh, audience here, uh, I would like to thank you for your collaborations and the enthusiasm to research. And we're very much looking forward to uh, further collaboration with you in the near future. Thank you very much. Uh, that almost end the proceedings today, but everyone is invited to stay behind because there's drink and snack out there. Uh, <laughs> do stay behind, talk to Trish and other people. And those of you who are uh, uh, expected to be at dinner, if you don't know where to go, uh, just, just follow Trish. I mean, he will guide you where that is. And thank you for coming. Good evening. <laughs>